Grab your Bibles and uh, turn to Titus 2. Let's jump in and, and look at the authority of God's Word. Every week I say this, I want you to see this with your own eyes as we walk through Mark chapter 2 and continue to walk through Mark. The intention is to look at the Gospel of Mark and his historical writings on this person, Jesus, and what it would be like to live life with Jesus. We live in the 21st century. We're going back to the first century. To eyewitness accounts to the life of Jesus and the synoptic gospels give us eyewitness accounts. This isn't fiction. Four different authors, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, write about the life of Jesus and what he did. And our hope is that our lives would begin to reflect a life with Jesus, that we truly believe in Jesus and that we're following him. And that we, as a part of the family of God, the, the church is God's vehicle to share the truth of the gospel. This is the purpose of the church. We don't get to invent our own mission. We're called to help people find and follow Jesus the way Jesus said is, go make disciples. In order to make a disciple, you have to be a disciple. This is the mission of the church, centered on the good news of the gospel. I'm going to ask you a question. This morning as I was reflecting, I shifted gears, and, and this question is where I want to start today. In, in a room full of people from all kinds of backgrounds, growing up at different places, in the church, outside of the church, all kinds of experiences. I know many of you have a real answer to this question. Have you been hurt by the church? There are a lot of ways people explain this. I've talked to a lot of people in 25 years of pastoral ministry who've, who've been hurt and, and, and rarely is it, but sometimes it's, it's the global church. It's a, it's, a, it's a universal church that has hurt them in a specific way. But most of the time, it's, it's a small group of people in the church that hurt them. And then the church is lumped into the whole thing. The church hurt me. A lot of times, it's a leader in the church or, or a pastor in the church that is hurt. It comes through church discipline sometimes. But most of the time, when you talk to people who've been hurt in the church... It centers on a, a specific experience that they've had. I can speak to this. I've been hurt in a church. I'm probably different than you. I, I was cast out of the church at 22 years old. That's right, put out of the church. I know everybody says they didn't do anything wrong, but I'm telling you, I did nothing to be cast out of the church. I was erased from the church documents. My name, my last name, was expunged from the Christian camp of this denomination, the buildings, and, and my name, Matsky, was taken off as a 22-year-old, third-generation pastor in this denomination, my family was cast out. I did nothing wrong. Some of you have heard specifics of the story, and it doesn't matter for the sermon today. The sins of the Father fall from generation to generation. I experienced church hurt. But you need to know that more than church hurt... It was gossip. It was gossip about somebody else, not me, but it fell on me. It was clicks. It was, it was all these things, abuse, disappointment, all came into play. It was the church. Brothers and sisters in Christ, those of you who are true believers, it was the church who cared for Heidi and I when we were broken. It was the church that came around us. When our marriage was falling apart, we had nowhere to go, and we moved and ran away from church to church. We had no idea what God was doing. But it was the church that cared for us. This past week, Heidi, for my 35th birthday, took uh, me to... <laughs> what's, that's not a joke. <laughs> took me to Toby Mac. A bunch of us went to Toby Mac. 
Toby Mack's been doing, doing Christian music for a long time. I remember going to him at Red Rocks Amphitheater in Denver, and he, he and Kevin Tate were doing backflips off the speakers. He did not do a single backflip, but at age 60, that guy still has it. And he debuted a song that he hadn't done before, but he's been doing on this tour. Coming out of hurt and pain and brokenness, he wrote this song, and the words went like this, I could use a little church right now. Love to have my family around. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I could use a little church right now. That resonated with me on Thursday night. You see, I know church hurt is real. I know there is abuse. I'm not justifying that. I know there is gossip. I know there are social cliques, and there is disappointment. The church, the people, the leaders, your friends, your so-called family, they will disappoint you. The church is full of sinners and hypocrites. We hear this all the time. I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. I go to the bar. In the last three to five years, the tone of church hurt has changed. It grieves my soul. The, the cultural corruption has crept into the church. It used to be church hurt in regards to legalism. It, it, it's spun into so many different ways where you have judgmentalism and, and hypocrisy and churches have, have given to this and become pragmatic. They, they want to make sinners feel comfortable because of the cultural corruption. They want to make sinners feel loved. One local pastor in Sacramento said these things. Freedom and fun must be reinstated into our faith. Why? So the non-Christian will be attracted he goes on to say, grace saved us from sin and freed us from obligation and duty to obey. Living out this freedom is difficult because there are so many grace killers in the church. Oh, man, that hit me in the heart. This is a new form of antinomialism, this old heresy that's creeped in the church that says, Jesus died for your sins. He loves you just the way you are. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. You just believe you don't have to change. If God loves you just the way you are, I say, then why did he die on the cross? He doesn't like us stuck in our sins. This causes church hurt. Grace killers this pastor defines as narrow-minded, judgmental, intolerant bullies who impose bondage on Christians and kill freedom. They kill freedom, they kill spontaneity, creativ creativity, productivity, and joy. Church, I want to tell you this morning, there is a fine line between grace and truth. There is a fine line. If you don't have absolute truth in your worldview, it's a worldview, not a biblical worldview. The biblical worldview, not the Christian. The Christian worldview has become unbiblical. The, the biblical worldview is that there is absolute truth. There's not many truths. And that in this truth, there is grace. And if you don't have truth, you don't have grace. And if you extend grace, but there isn't an understanding of truth, there isn't real grace. We are saved by grace through faith. It's not of our works. This is an absolute truth. If we think we can earn our way to salvation or earn our way to heaven, we haven't received grace. We're saying we've earned and deserved grace. It's not how it works. So to set up the sermon and, and to understand the, the fine line between grace and truth, let's go to the Apostle Paul's writing to this young pastor named Titus who's been given the task of pastoring a church that has walked away from truth and doesn't understand grace. And there's a lack of leadership. There's a lack of qualified leaders. The, the world has crept into the church and it's made it corrupt. And, and Paul is saying to Titus, okay, you got to set things in order. 
And in, in chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, I want you to see these words about grace and truth. For grace, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. God is a gracious God. We didn't earn salvation. It's a gift. Verse 12, this grace that he's talking about, verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. This is what grace does. It helps us to walk in truth. Before we had grace, we were walking in opposition to truth. We were walking in sin. We were defined by sin. We desired sin. We liked sin. We were at enmity against God. We would justify sin. We would say sin isn't sin. The world still is doing this. But grace appears, training and teaching us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearance, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself to redeem us from lawlessness and to purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. Paul, writing to Titus, he says in verse 11, declare these things, exhort these things, rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. Don't let people say, hey, stop being a grace killer. Because there is no grace. Grace is killed when truth is eliminated, ignored, or redefined. The church has adopted the God of this world's philosophy on grace and truth. It's now beyond the old school legalism and old school licentiousness, which means lawlessness. It is a whole new level of scheme that is devouring Christians. The grace of God came to save us. The grace of God came to instruct us and train us and sanctify us to walk away from ungodliness. Our freedom in Christ is not freedom to continue in sin. Our freedom in Christ calls us to walk in a different manner. I think uh, Sunday night service coming up this next month, I'm playing around with the idea of talking about grace and freedom and unpacking this at a deeper level, but I want to set this up for today's sermon so that when we come and we see what Jesus is enduring, he's enduring here church hurt. We're going to see him dealing with church hurt. I want you to understand the importance of grace and truth that hold the true bride of Christ together. J.C. Ryle, in his commentary on the verses we're going to look at in Mark, so turn back over to Mark if you can, he says this, we learn from these verses of the power of Christ to call men out of the world and make them his disciples. We read that he here says to Levi, while he's sitting at a tax booth, follow me. And at once he got up and followed him. From tax collector, he became an apostle, a writer of the first book of the New Testament, which is known all over the world. This is the truth, he says, that is deep imp of deep importance. Without a divine call, no one can be saved. And we are all so sunk into sin, so welded, his words, welded to the world that we would never turn to God and seek salvation unless he first called us by his grace. Verse 13, 14, 15, and 16, grace is demonstrated in truth. Verse 17, grace is explained. And, and Mark is doing this in the first several chapters to unpack a series of controversies. We've, this is our second controversy we see Jesus having with the religious leaders. Controversies that emphasize the authority of Jesus 
to reveal grace and truth. The calling of Levi is imperative. Mark wants us to know and understand grace and truth so that we can see and become humble recipients of God's saving work. This is the main point this morning. Jesus continues to forgive sins. That's the why he came. And he does this by calling sinners to follow and to fellowship with him. Let's unpack this and see Jesus calling for people to follow and to fellowship. First, verse 13 to 14, Jesus calls, this is important, he calls the unlikely to follow him. He went out beside the sea, and he called the crowds coming to him, and all the crowds were coming to him. And he was didasko, the Greek word for teaching. It's in the imperfect tense. This is a picture of Jesus teaching one point after another. Now, I, I say that because it's not a word for expositional, verse by verse preaching. It's a word for point by point teaching. It, the focus of this word is on the content that's being taught. And in the context, the purpose is dis to discover, we see this when it's used for Jesus, didasco, used for Jesus' teaching, it is to discover truths contrary to world psychology and philosophy and religion. Every time Jesus is unpacking in some way, shape, or form false beliefs in psychology, world, religion, and philosophy. Synagogue teaching it was different. It was more preaching. It was expository. Scripture was read and then explained section by section, verse by verse. But by, di by didasco, it carries the idea of systematic teaching, systematic theology and doctrine. These were not TED Talks. They weren't. This was truth. And the truth of sound doctrine is vital for one's faith and spiritual growth. More and more as we move people here at Sun River to move out of the pew and into one-on-one -on -one life relation, discipling relationships, I am more and more convinced that at the center of these discipling relationships are two things. You take one or two of these out. You don't have discipling. You have world mentorship. The two things are the authority of God's word and doctrine. You don't know Christ without doctrine. You'll be tossed to and fro by all the winds of doctrine that aren't true. That's a sermon for another day. Jesus was called rabbi or teacher more than any other name in Scripture. In fact, 45 to 58, I counted, New Testament uses for the Greek word teacher, didaskolos, was used on Jesus almost every time referring to public teaching of truth, referring to theology. Close to 97 times, the occurrence of didasco is used to reference an activity that Jesus is doing. It's what he did. It's who he was. Verse 14, and he passed. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at a tax booth. He walks by a tax collector. Most likely, because of the size of Capernaum, most likely, Levi, also known as Matthew, saw Jesus, crossed his path a couple of times. Jesus is popular. He's, he, as we've learned, he's, in, he's drawn a crowd. Most likely, he heard the words that Jesus said. Most likely, he saw the things that Jesus did. Jews 
despised tax collectors. Levi, as a tax collector, was not welcome in church. He wasn't. In the synagogue, he was not allowed as a tax collector to set foot in the church. Whether you believe in Jesus, whether you agree with me or not, you are welcome here. You're welcome. Belief is the thing in Jesus, the truth of Jesus, is what allows you to belong. You can attend, you can, but without belief, you won't truly fully belong. But you are more than welcome here. And we hope and pray, wherever you're at, the Spirit will move and you will see God's grace and truth. Jews despised tax collectors, so they weren't allowed to go to church. So he probably never heard an expositional sermon from Jesus or any other rabbi or ruler. Tax collectors embezzled money. They betrayed their own people. They rejected their heritage. They despised the temple. They renounced God. As a matter of fact, in some rabbinical writings, specifically the Mishnah in five different places, they were compared to murderers and robbers, tax collectors. They sold themselves to pagans from a Jewish worldview. So can you imagine the scandal Jesus created when he walks by and he calls, just like he did those other Jewish teenagers, he calls Levi to become one of his inner circle of friends. Spurgeon, I love the way he put it on his commentary on Matthew. He said, Matthew was at the time busy taking, but when he was called to follow Jesus, that was a work of giving. You see this? He went from taking and stealing. It's a, it's a clear picture of repentance to, to giving. He said to him, follow me. And Matthew rose and followed him. Follow me. We, we talked a lot about this. I've defined this word. I've explained it. This essentially is God's official call to discipleship. His official call to be a Christian. His official call to be saved, to believe. It's a different call and a different belief than the demons that believe, but, but they're not saved. This, this is his official response to draw people in. He calls them. Jesus addresses a despised tax collector. This is the most unlikely person you would think would receive the call. But this tells us that God and proves to us God's word. He is not partial. Jesus shows his open arms regarding all sinners. Akolatheu is the Greek word. This word expresses union with Follow me. Be in union. Be in communion with me. It means likeness. Likeness in the way we walk, the road we travel. Remember, the, in the ancient world, rabbis called disciples to bind them to the law. This was what a rabbi said. The kids would study the law. They would memorize the Tanakh, the whole Old Testament, the, the Torah. And then they would, if they were the best of the best of the best, be called to follow a rabbi and bind themselves to the law that they memorized. But Jesus, he changes the paradigm and he calls men to be bound to himself. Jesus, not human performance of the Mosaic law, not the Talmud, not the Tanakh, None of the written laws is the way of salvation. Repentance is not a turning back to the Mosaic law, but turning to Jesus, the Messiah. Remember, Jesus didn't reject the law. He came to fulfill it. He's the only way we can fulfill the law. Apart from Jesus, there is no salvation. There is no hope. 
For Matthew, the call to attach himself permanently to Jesus involves no small financial loss. We see the same thing when Zacchaeus answered the call to follow Jesus. It's no small financial loss, but had an infinite spiritual gain. Levi was perhaps the last of the 12 apostles to be, or disciples to be called. But the fact that one of them was selected from a despised class of people, that should speak very significantly to each one of us. And if you don't think you're in that despised category, you probably don't understand the depth of sin. And if you don't understand the depth of sin, you're, you're good, you're comfortable. You don't understand that, that your sin is personal against a holy God. You probably don't understand grace and truth. Beloved here today, don't miss this. I just, I've got to pause for a second and say, whatever sin you carry, whatever shame you have, whatever's going on in your life that you're like, I just can't meet God's standard, and, 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 and whatever the hurt or guilt and shame is, this is a clear picture that Jesus is calling you to come to him, to follow him today and into eternity. This isn't just believe, this is come into fellowship with him. And we're going to see this clearly here. Believers in Christ are called to follow to be tethered to Jesus in such a way that they reflect Jesus to the lost world. This is the vehicle God has chosen and designed to reach the lost world. He could do it any other way. We would probably pick a different way for him to do it. He's sovereign. He's in control. But the vehicle is the church following Jesus in a real authentic relationship. A close friend asked Gandhi, if you admire Christ so much, why don't you become a Christian? To that, he replied, when I meet a Christian who is a follower of Christ, I will consider it. Wow. A Christian, listen. Just listen. A Christian is supposed to be a reflection of Jesus Christ, a, a follower of Jesus. Joe Stolwell, in his book, he was a former president of Moody Bible Institute, in his book, Following Christ, he said this, and it's so true, even though this was written a long time ago, it's still true today. Many of us live out our faith as though Christ exists to follow us. We come to believe that Christ exists and satisfies our demands. This disguised form of self-serving religion sets Christ up as just one more commodity in life that will enhance and empower our dreams. This is a scheme from the devil. Deny yourself. Die to yourself. Take up your cross and follow. When Jesus called his disciples to follow, he meant that he would do the leading and directing, and they would do the following. Luke chapter 5, verse 27. Like disciples, we must give up our will, our desires, knowing that they lead us away from God. This is what repentance is, and obey Him. Obedience doesn't save us. We choose to lose our lives for Him. He is the ultimate chief of our lives. And we spend the rest of our lives gold digging. For, sorry. <laughs> Chiefs, 49ers. They have to throw it in there somewhere. In God's truths, we're digging for gold and allowing him to transform us. Okay, moving right along. Grace <laughs> demonstrated by truth. We're going to see this. Jesus calls... Sorry, I couldn't help it. Be unlikely to follow him. But he also, look at this, calls the undesirable to fellowship. 
This is what's going on in the scriptures. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with him. And his disciples, with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. You see, Mark shifts gears. The scene now shifts into Levi's house, which is probably a pretty nice house because he was rolling in money that he had stolen. We see Jesus choosing to dine with the people in Levi's social outcast club, fellow tax collectors, other people that society recognized as immoral or not fully human, the low caste, so to speak. Mark takes note here, there were many of them, and they're following Jesus. It's important, the words at the table, in context, and, and as I studied this, it came, it came clearer and clearer, at the table, in, con- in context, there's this lingering and reclining together. In the first century, breaking bread with someone was a sign of social acceptance. Jesus is making a statement here of friendship and social acceptance. And the Pharisees were outraged. They were outraged. They're outraged because... We learned last week, he, in the last two weeks, he forgives sins and only God can do that. Well, he's God, so he's doing it. They didn't like that. That was the first controversy. He's forgiving sins. He's the only one that can do that. And now he's learning he's fellowshipping with sinners. Why? Why is Jesus fellowshipping with sinners? Because there's no one else to fellowship. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one, Romans 3, that are good. All have fallen away. My sentiments, exactly. (laughs) I love it. I'm going to add 10 more minutes to the sermon for that. (laughs) I don't even know how to go on. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh. The undesirable to fellowship with him. He's reclining at the table with sinners. Hamartiano is the Hebrew word to miss the mark. We've talked about this. Those, it describes those who constantly are missing God's mark, living in opposition to his good, acceptable, and perfect will, missing his holy purpose of the law. He's with sinners and tax collectors. I'm going to make a quick note from Luke 20, verse 25. Jesus himself affirmed the appropriateness and authority of paying taxes. You remember that? When he said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. He's sitting with sinners and tax collectors. He's fellowshipping with them and his disciples, those who are following him. The word disciple here, mathetes, is the, where we get the English word mathematics. It describes a person who learns from another by instruction, whether formal or informal. Discipleship includes the idea of one who intentionally learns by Inquiry, this would be a good illustration of an inductive Bible study and what we try to do on Wednesday nights, but also by observation and application. This is what the disciple means. It's not just head knowledge. It's an application to it. This illustration has been used by others. Francis Chan and I've used it. But could you imagine if I wrote a letter to Sydney and I said, Sydney, in the letter it says, please clean your room before I get home. 
or Zach, please clean your room before I get home. And I come home, and Zach and Sydney are sitting on the floor, and they're saying, Dad, we got your letter. It's so good. We got it. We got the letter. Thank, well, that's good. Yeah, we got all our friends here, and Zach's looking up the Greek word on his phone, and we've memorized it. We've got note cards, and they're like studying it, and they're looking at it, and they're, but the room's a disaster. That would be, that would be ridiculous. You see, a disciple is somebody who learns, observes, and applies. A man or woman who is called to be a disciple binds himself to the one in order to acquire his practical and theoretical knowledge. And now we see church hurt. And we see how Jesus responds to church hurt. Here Jesus calls the unhealthy to faith in him. Verse 16, and the scribes of the Pharisees. The phrase scribes of the Pharisees simply describes men within the sect of Pharisees who were lawmakers, men who were professional theologians of the law and Old Testament scholars. And, and they're traced through history all the way back in the Old Testament to uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. When the Israelites returned to their homeland after captivity from Babylon, the Pharisees meaning the ones set apart. Their righteousness was not a result of transformation of the heart by God. It was external religion, hypocritical righteousness. It was legalism and rule-keeping and judgmentalism and outward show. They were tethered to the law, even though it wasn't in their hearts, even though in private they didn't practice it. William Barclay says to the Jews, religion was a thing of endless rules. People lived their lives in an endless forest of regulation, which dedicated every action. They must listen forever and ever and ever to the voice, don't, don't, don't. And it plays out like this, because I grew up in this. We don't go to movies. We don't listen to Journey. <laughs> we don't dance. We wear black socks to church and a tie. It's all about we don't. It's a form of legalism. By the way, I just want to explain real quickly. Legalism is believing you have to do something to earn God's favor and go to heaven. And if you don't do it, then you're not really a Christian. Now, the world will know we're Christians by our fruit. Don't misunderstand. The Pharisees essentially mess this up. They were so bent on the rules when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors. Notice the religious leaders were watching, but they weren't joining in the meal. They weren't fellowshipping with Jesus. They had all the head knowledge. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah, but they had all this religion. They said to his disciples, why does he, if you have your Bibles, I want you to see this, why does he sin? It's not what it says, but that's what they're saying. Why is he sinning by eating with sinners? It's not a sin to eat with sinners. It's a sin to sin. These sinners knew the truth. They were getting exposed to grace. He talked about sin. He his whole message was repentance. It wasn't philanthropy. It wasn't covering it up and baiting and switching. No, he came out from the beginning and said, repent of your sins. 
Repent and believe. Repent and believe. He healed people to prove that he was the Messiah who came, calling people to repent and believe. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? I read this, and you would think that they would expect the people of God, they would expect, you would expect the people of God, the religious people, to at this point rejoice, right? Wouldn't they, the religious leaders be better off going, wow, Matthew has repented of stealing our money. This is, let's, let's have a meal. Let's celebrate. No, no, they don't even see because they're so nearsighted in their own religion that they don't see their own sin is now corrupt and keeping them from seeing the grace and truth in somebody else's life. And then Mark shows us grace being explained in verse 17. And when he heard, and when Jesus heard it, he said to them, after showing them what grace and truth looks like, he now is going to say what it is. Those who are well have no need of a physician. Those who are sick, they're ridiculing him. He's talking directly to him. You guys think you're fine. You're comfortable. You go to church on Sunday and you, you memorize some verses, and, but you don't know truth. And since you don't know the truth, and it's not personal in your heart, you, you'll never understand and receive grace. I came not to call righteous, but sinners. He's not talking about physical sickness. He's talking about spiritual sickness. He's talking about being dead in sin. There is a very important principle here. Unless a person is conscious about the fact that he is under the bad news of God's wrath, he is not likely to hear with ears of faith the good news of God's love. Churches and Christians so badly want people to know how much God loves them, they will never know how much they're loved unless they know how much sin God hates so much wrath that he put it on his son. This is personal. Churches and Christians cause church hurt. The real eternal church hurt is revealed when churches become attracting to sinners and don't acknowledge out of love the truth of what effects sin has on them for eternity. When Christians give in to this psychology and they think they're helping people, they're just creating more self-worship. This doesn't mean we browbeat. This doesn't mean we shame. Just like we don't with our kids, we, we help them to see. We love our kids so much. We, we don't want them to walk thinking they can do whatever they want and they're free. No, no, you spoil the kid when you do that. You discipline them. Jesus, God disciplines those he loves. A no repenting gospel, a no holiness gospel, a no submission gospel, a no transforming gospel is a false security gospel. Jesus came, he died and took our place, paid the price for our sins, calls us to believe and repent of our sins. And then he rose again, displaying victory over sin and death, giving the believer a new way to live, a new way to walk. Would you stand, lift your voices, singing about and praising God, saying hallelujah that Christ has risen. We've been given new life, a different way. Freedom from sin and death.